And now we have the Starling Medal. This is the third year that the Starling Medal has been awarded, and it's awarded to a mid-career scientist who's on a very steep upward trajectory. So I'm delighted to invite David Hodson to give the Starling Medal. David um, started his career in Bristol, and he spent time in uh, um, Montpellier in France, and then came back to the UK working at Imperial College London. And he's now in Birmingham as a professorial research fellow. So his work uh, is, his, he leads a lab on islet biology, and he's pioneered uh, new techniques in endocrine imaging. And so he will be talking about his research in this area. Thank you very much. So I'm absolutely honored uh, to be here today to present the Stalin Medal Lecture. And I have pretty big uh, shoes to fill, in fact, size 12s, because this was awarded to Gareth Lavery and Rob Semple in previous years. Uh, so I'm hoping I can do uh, the lecture some justice today. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how sort of messing around in the lab and coming up with new tools can actually drive innovation in endocrinology. So because this is the Starling Medal Lecture, I should say a few words about Ernest Starling himself. And most of you will be familiar with the name because, of course, Ernest Starling discovered seminal mechanisms underlying the regulation of blood volume, heart rate, and importantly for us, termed um, or coined the term hormone uh, for the actions of uh, secretin released from the pancreas. And he even found time to research poison gases during World War I when he was seconded to the military. And I think for all of us here today, what's becoming quite apparent is metabolism and endocrinology is quite difficult and quite complex. And often we have to seek other areas and other disciplines and other techniques to help us answer our questions. And we shouldn't be afraid of doing this because Ernest Stalin was obviously doing this uh, 100 years ago. So the chief focus of my lab is type 2 diabetes, and this is a complex metabolic disease. But I, I like to boil it down to this graph here. And in the early phases of the disease, we have an increase in insulin resistance, but this is met with functional compensation by the beta cells, so they release more insulin. However, there's an undefined time point when insulin resistance continues to increase, but now insulin secretion begins to relatively decrease. And this is because the beta cells have given up. They've gone into failure, they've had enough. And again, the mechanisms are pretty poorly characterized, but likely involve dedifferentiation and apoptosis. But at this point, when we see the rise in blood glucose levels, which drives the complications of type 2 diabetes, so amputation, cancer risk, cardiovascular risk, retinopathy, and so forth. And it's an important disease because it's increasing in incidence so I think it's classed now by the World Health Organization as being the third most important non-communicable disease state after cancer and cardiovascular disease. And it accounts for about 5% of adult deaths around the world. But also, the complications of the disease are very difficult to treat, and it costs the NHS about a million pounds a day to treat type 2 diabetes and its complications. So really, a fundamental aspect is failure of the beta cells, and most treatments target beta cell function. So we try to boost insulin secretion in most cases, as well as sensitize to released insulin. So we know a lot about the single cell mechanisms by which beta cells respond to glucose. In fact, they are glucose sensors par excellence. In response to an elevation in blood glucose, they import a molecule of the sugar into the cytosol, this is then metabolized to yield an increase in the ratio of ATP to ADP. This leads to a cascade of events, notably closure of the ATP-sensitive potassium channels. And because we now accumulate potassium in the cytosol, we depolarize the cell, and this leads to opening of the voltage-dependent calcium channels. Calcium floods in and drives calcium-dependent insulin secretion. And this is a classic case of stimulus secretion coupling, and it's pretty similar to how pituitary cells or chromaffin cells operate. But there's another level of insulin secretory regulation that we don't really know too much about, and that's called the intra-islet regulation of insulin secretion. In humans, we have about a million islets, 
and within them about 100 to 1,000 beta cells. And if we break the islet apart and culture the beta cells in two dimensions, they will secrete less insulin than when they are together. And the reason for this is they can talk to each other, they can communicate their activities, so they know when to be on and when to be off. And this is because the islet is actually a complex signaling node. It hosts many signaling pathways. So we have paracrine, which is essentially chemical messengers, juxtacrine, which is contact-dependent messages, for example, inexins or efferins. We have gap junctions, which is electrical coupling, a little bit like we have in the heart. And we even have ciliary and neural. And we sort of serendipitously um, came upon this about five years ago now when we took some human islets and we applied some GLP-1 to them. GLP-1 is released from the gut in response to food intake and, of course, is the basis of the incretimimetic drug class. And what happens is when you apply GLP-1 to the human islet, the beta cells all sort of function and come to life synchronously. So you get this nice sort of hill and then they switch off. But what we did is we correlated BMI of the donors with the ability of the beta cells to display this behavior. And we saw that it was lost as BMIs got higher and was pretty much almost absent at BMIs over 30. We also got some tissue from donors with type 2 diabetes and we saw, again, loss of the ability of the cells to coordinate their behavior. So they do respond, but now at different times. So it looks as though this communication between the beta cells is very important for insulin secretion and it goes wrong during obesogenic states or during type 2 diabetes. And this is work that was done by Ryan Mitchell, uh, a PhD student at the time. So we become, or began to become more interested in sort of what was driving the communication between cells. And this is an example of how the cells are communicating. We're now measuring calcium as a proxy for insulin outputs. And you see the cells flash on together, off together, on together, and off together. And during this time, they're releasing insulin. But if you look more carefully, what you notice is a little bit like the sinoatrial node of the heart. Some of the cells respond before the others, and then they propagate the signal throughout the population. And we turn these cells hubs, and they serve a pacemaker function. But to really understand what these hubs might do, we had to devise an interdisciplinary research approach where we can model and identify these cells, and then use biosensors and insulin probes to read out the functional consequences of um, cell activity, and then photopharmacology, which we'll talk about a little more later, and optogenetics, so we can deactivate the cells precisely while seeing what happens to the rest of the population. So we came up with an optogenetic mouse model, and in this model, the beta cells express a light-activated chloride pump, and when you switch the chloride pump on, the cells become silenced. We see it throughout the population, and we see it specifically in beta cells. And we thought with this, we could use a laser to silence and take the hub cells out of the equation to see whether they actually had a causal association with islet function. So this is the electrophysiology here. What we see is if we take an optogenetic beta cell, it fires action potentials in response to 11 millimolar glucose, so high glucose, and we switch an orange-red light on and we completely silence activity, and it's reversible. We switch the light off and it comes back to life. We don't see anything in wild-type islets. So to understand the causal association, we need to do these recordings in real time, which is quite challenging. So we take our islet, we record how the population is functioning, and then we identify where the hubs are go back in and silence them while seeing what the consequences are for the rest of the population. And this is what it looks like. So before optogenetic silencing, you see we have a hub cell in red here, and the islet's very well connected. Each of these gray bars represents cells showing similar behavioral patterns. And we see that the cells are all on together, off together, on together. But if we target and silence the hub cell, we see that we lose this behavior. So now responses become much more stochastic, a little bit like we saw during type 2 diabetes and also during obesity. And then we turn the laser off, the hub comes back to life, and we see resumption of normal activity. So we can do this the other way around. We can now stimulate the cells to see what happens. And to do this, we devised the light-activated sulfonylurea. Sulfonylureas bind to the subunit on the ATP-sensitive potassium channel and they cause the channel to close a little bit like the ratios of ATP to ADP, leading to depolarization, calcium fluxes, and insulin secretion. And of course, sulfonylureas are potent insulin secretors for this reason. And what we did is we 
installed uh, azo benzene photoresponsive element on to the sulfon urea so we can turn the endogenous channel into a photo switch. So we apply the drug, and when we apply blue light, we can deactivate the channel. This is the drug that we produced here, it's JB253, and you see we have the sulfon urea moiety, and circled in color is the azobenzene photoresponsive element. And what this does is it changes its shape, it isomerizes in response to light. So low wavelengths of light, blue light, we see cis isomerization, so it compacts its shape, and in response to high wavelengths of light, it extends its conformation, so it sort of becomes more uh, or longer. And this is reversible. You can switch it between one state and another state. And of course, when you change the molecular motion of the drug, you change how it binds to its subunit, and you change the open or closed state of the ATP-sensitive potassium channel. So what we can do is we can map where our hub cell is. We can shut down the islet using low glucose, and then we can pulse with a blue laser. And we see that when we do this, we recreate the wiring patterns. And the entrainment runs between cells at about 42 micron per second. So this is likely electrical. And this is work that uh, we did in collaboration with Dirk Trauner's lab, uh, now in New York University. So to understand what makes these cells different to the other cells, we had to develop an approach where we can use a photoactivatable red fluorescent protein to paint the single hub cells, and then we can go back afterwards and then see what makes their protein composition different to the rest of the population. And what we see is that actually the cells don't really resemble beta cells. They are, but they have low levels of beta cell identity markers, NKX 6.1, PDX1 and low levels of insulin, but they are metabolically adapted. They have high levels of glucokinase, which is the rate limiting step in glucose metabolism. And this is probably why they're able to be the first responders to glucose. And this just shows how metabolically adapted they are. So now we're measuring mitochondrial potential. And mitochondrial potential tells you how fast the ATP synthase is spinning and how much ATP you are producing. And we see that in our hub cells, it's about threefold higher than in the rest of the population. And they appear to be vulnerable to type 2 diabetes insults. So this is now a paradigm of systemic inflammation. We apply IL-1 beta and IL-1-6, and we see what happens to these cells. With control, nothing. They're still there. But when we apply the cytokine, we can see them fail before our eyes. And this happens very quickly, within two hours. And the reason for this is probably because they have low levels of circa 2. So this is sarcoplasmic endoplasmic reticulum calcium ATPase, and it allows you to maintain calcium homeostasis in the endoplasmic reticulum. And when you don't do this, cells become very vulnerable to apoptosis. And changes in the expression of circa associated with Wolfson syndrome, one, and of course, a hallmark of that is beta cell apoptosis and diabetes. So the million dollar question is, can they contribute to insulin secretion? We can't measure insulin from a single islet. No kit has a sensitivity. So we collaborated with Mike Watkinson's group at Queen Mary's University London to produce a zinc sensing probe. And the reason for this is a bit like um, the OVA that Teresa was talking about. When insulin is secreted, it dissolutes and releases zinc iron because zinc is required for proper crystallization of the insulin granule. And in fact, the islets have very high levels of uh, zinc for this reason. So we can use it as a proxy for insulin secretion, and we see that if we look at non-hub cells, nothing happens, we have insulin output, wild type islets the same, but when we silence one of our hub cells, we see a drop in insulin output. So what I've just told you is quite difficult to take on board given how we view type 2 diabetes, because we generally think about type 2 diabetes as being a state of profound beta cell dedifferentiation. So they go backwards, and they become less beta cell-like, hence why they don't operate as beta cells. But what I'm telling you is that actually some relative immaturity is a good thing and probably quite important for our function. So to assess this, we devised a loss of heterogeneity model. And this is work in collaboration with Joe Zhu, who will present some data tomorrow. And what we could do is overexpress a construct which allows low PDX1 expressing cells to become high, but doesn't affect those that already have high levels of PDX1. So we shift the cells to a more mature landscape. And 
What we see is that actually this is quite bad for islet function. They no longer properly respond to glucose, and they don't respond in a coordinated manner. They look more like islets from type 2 diabetes individuals. And we see a loss in our hub cells because, of course, we now have less immature cells available in the islet to serve this function. And this leads to quite dysregulated uh, insulin secretion. So they respond inappropriately to low glucose levels. And this translates to a loss in the full change of insulin secretion in response to both glucose and extending four. And this is work uh, done by a talented postdoc, Daniela Nasteska. Um, this is actually a picture from the Birmingham canteen. We have exquisite dining facilities there. <laughs> so the whole concept of heterogeneity, islets are a little like society. So you have beta cells from all sorts of different backgrounds, and this appears to be very important for their different functions. So we've got studies using uh, markers from um, Mark Huisin's group, which show that cells that express low levels of uricortin-3 are proliferative. Studies from Heiko Lickert's group showing that cells that express low levels of flat top are also proliferative. Studies from our group showing the existence of metabolically adapted immature herbs. And similar studies from Richard Benninger's group showing a metabolically adapted population which responds first to glucose. So it's important because if we're going to treat diabetes, we need to essentially understand when the cells become lost and how we target individual populations to either get proliferation or a functional outcome. And it's also important because we can now make islets from pluripotent stem cells, but we need to be able to recreate this proper landscape, this heterogeneity, for them to function properly. So what I'm going to do for the last 10 minutes is just show you some new tools we've been developing. And the reason for this is because we need to be able to probe signaling pathways to understand better heterogeneity, particularly in human islets, where we can't do genetic approaches as readily as in mice. And we became fascinated in the concept of signaling diversity uh, through the GLP-1 receptor. Of course, these are the incretimimetics, blockbuster drugs uh, used for the treatment of diabetes. And this is one of them, lyroglutide. And lyroglutide has two alpha helices separated by a linker. And it just flops around in solution. It's conformationally free. And when it hits the receptor, it kind of configures into one of its conformations, which is more active. And we don't know which one that is. So what we did is we decided to constrain the conformation of the peptide by putting a light-activated bridge between the two alpha helices. So now, with low wavelengths of light, we can compact it through cis isomerization, and with higher wavelengths of light, we can re-extend it. And we rationalize that this might tell us which form is required for better receptor function. And the light-activated bridge is again an azobenzene photoresponsive unit. They're very flexible and very reliable, but because this is a peptide, we now encode it with an artificial amino acid sequence termed AMPP. And it works really well. If we put it on, we see a left shift in cyclic AMP, those responses, so now we generate more cyclic AMP, and this translates to improved insulin secretion. And what you'll notice is the UV illuminated, the compacted form, which signals better. Okay, and it signals a little bit better than native lyroglutide. And this was work done by Johannes Broischhagen, who was a traveling postdoc in the lab and now a junior group leader at MPI. So moving on from this, we couldn't understand why you can't conditionally activate a G-protein coupled receptor in a given cell or in a given tissue. And this is important because sometimes you want to understand why G-protein coupled receptors might contribute to glucose homeostasis, whereas others might have other effects. So this approach is termed tethered pharmacology, and we produced a drug called exonatide. And exonatide is exenatide. You can see we have sort of all sorts of fun naming our drugs. Um, and what this is, is it's exending 4, and it's conjugated to a benzyl guanine moiety via a flexible peg leash. And this means it only binds to cells expressed in the SNAP-tagged GLP-1 receptor. When it does this, the GPCR internalizes. This is what happens upon stimulation. It goes into the endosomal compartment, but we can't get it off. It just remains like this until we apply a reducing agent to cleave the disulfide bridge, and then the receptor undergoes conventional recycling. And this is the molecular dimensions, and you can see the GLP-1 receptor in black. 
and the N-terminus is kind of hanging out of the membrane, and we have our extending four in the orthostoic site, and you can see it's now attached to the snap tag on the N-terminus via this peg leash. And it works really well. This is just an example of one experiment. We're now measuring calcium, and we've engineered these cells to possess snap tag GLP-1 receptors. And we see that exonotide increases calcium. Similarly to extending four, it's actually much more potent for a given dose. And we can wash responses to extending four out, but not exonotide. In fact, we can only wash these responses out when we apply reducing agent to cleave the molecule. And this allows us to control trafficking of the receptor. So exonotide now drives the receptor into the uh, intracellular compartment. And normally we can prevent this if we apply a high dose of antagonist, but this doesn't happen. It just remains stuck or tethered. But if we apply beta mercaptoethanol we now see restoration to the membrane. And it's a flexible approach. Uh, this is ghrelin, which is ghrelin. And we can do this with a class A GPCR now. So ghrelin binds, again, to cells we've engineered to have the snap-tagged ghrelin receptor. You get an increase in calcium, this time partially washed out, but we can fully wash it out when we apply reducing agent. And this is work done by a postdoc in the lab, Yuli Rast, and Tom Podewin, who was a visiting PhD student in the lab. You can see he likes fishing. This fish was actually quite small. He's just holding it really close to the camera, so it looks much bigger. Um, so I kind of just wanted to end um, by making the point that I think as an early career or mid-career researcher now, you really are a product of the mentorship that you have received. And uh, the stern-looking individual to your left is Domingo Totinezzi. And I did my PhD with Domingo. And actually, I was looking at equine ovine reproduction at the time because I wanted to make loads of money being a stud vet in Dubai. Um, didn't work out for me. <laughs> uh, and I became a researcher. Um, but he taught me how to write, uh, ironically. And he taught me that actually doing a PhD is not all about publishing massive papers. It's about having a vocation in research. Patrice Mollard, he was my postdoc advisor, spent four fantastic years in Montpellier. It's a beautiful place to work, but Patrice is an exceptional scientist, and he really taught me um, to sort of think about problems in a different way and not really be scared to adapt different techniques to try and answer your question. And then lastly, Guy Rutter, I was a junior group leader in his section. Uh, his, his fault, and I do Isla Biology, and he taught me a lot about biochemistry, which Again, ironically, I dismissed at vet school because I thought, what is the point of biochemistry? And then Q, 10 years later, I'm working in diabetes. But importantly, he taught me how to write grants and survive generally in the world of academia. So I'm very appreciative to these three individuals. So lastly, I just wanted to show you the true human cost of being a diabetes researcher. So the top picture is me in 2006. Finished the PhD, or started the PhD even, full head of black hair, jet black hair. Then five years forwards, I'm now a postdoc, working pretty long hours. I've got a good tan because I'm in the south of France, but I'm graying around the temples. And this is giving me some concern, as you can see by the photo. And this is when I finished in London. And this is what we call the reverse Benjamin Button, because now I've aged in an accelerated manner and I have a full head of gray hair, and even my own mother doesn't recognize me. Uh, so um, a lot of people involved with this work, it's, it's very interdisciplinary, it's very collaborative. I'm very appreciative to all the members of the lab. I have a fantastic group, uh, Dirk, Karsten, Dima, Anya, JB, and Tom. We do all the chemistry with them because I am not a chemist. And Lorenzo, Piero, Marco, Domenico, Patrick, who we do a lot of the islet or human islet work with, uh, Guy and Joe, from Imperial and Harvard that we work on the heterogeneity concept with. And then my colleagues at Birmingham, uh, Gareth, Dan, and Davida, that we started to do metabolomics with um, glucocorticoids as well, uh, which is something I never said I'd work in, but I've started to. And um, Davida, who we're doing a bit of imaging for the GPS CRs. And I'm very thankful to all the funders um, for taking a punt on me. And thank you uh, to all of you for listening. Thank you, David, for such a wonderful uh, multidisciplinary and truly illuminating lecture. And uh, we'll look forward to what the pictures look like in 10 years' time as well. So it gives me great pleasure to award the Starling Medal.